Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Dr. Roth, please, as we discuss. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Weiss. Good afternoon, and uh, welcome everyone to the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds, which is also the third annual Jacques Bourgogne Lectureship. Um, Jacques came to the University of Miami in 1976 from Albert Einstein College of Medicine to assume the position of Chief of the Division of Nephrology and Hypertension, position that he held for over 20 years. Uh, Jacques was a physician uh, who possessed the increasingly rare combination of excellence as a physician scientist, a clinician, an educator, and a leader. Uh, he was always uh, a true gentleman and brought compassion for his patients and real concern for the support of his faculty to the workplace on a daily basis. He was committed to the mission of the Miller School of Medicine, and it was his vision that laid the ground for, groundwork for what has become one of the stronger divisions of nephrology in the country. Uh, during his time, he brought some of the very first large, important multi-center NIH trials done in kidney disease to our center. <clears throat> and he was at the forefront in the early days <clears throat> for the description of what was later to become known as HIV-associated nephropathy. Jacques understood the unique and often challenging relationship between the University of Miami and Jackson Hospital and how our missions uh, were shared on certain important levels. And he passed that commitment along to the others uh, so that future chiefs like myself and now Alessia uh, can carry that forward and build on what he really started. This lectureship was established through the generosity of his family, friends, colleagues, and former fellows. It stands, I think, as a legacy to the man he was that so many joined together to honor him this way. He spent his life in science and search for new knowledge. And there's no better way, I think, to remember him than a Department of Medicine Grand Rounds lecture that's being presented by a thought leader in the field of nephrology. I'll turn this over to our chief residents at this time to introduce today's speaker for the Jacques Bourgogne Lectureship. So our speaker today will be Dr. Crystal Gadegbegu. Um, Dr. Crystal Gadegbeku is a professor of medicine and the section chief of nephrology, hypertension, and kidney transplantation at the Lewis Katz School of Medicine at Temple University. He has been involved in NIH-funded clinical and translation <coughs> research, ranging from epidemiologic studies to clinical trials in kidney disease and hypertension, including serving um, in leadership roles for multi-centered research collaborations. He also has an interest in exploring research engagement of diverse populations, especially among racial and ethnic groups overburdened with kidney disease. Her areas of clinical interest include management of hypertension and cardiovascular disease in patients with chronic kidney disease. Dr. Gadegbeku has served two terms as chair of the American Society of Nephrology, or ASN, Policy and Advocacy Committee, and currently serves as an ASN counselor and member of the National Kidney Foundation, American Society of Nephrology Task Force on reassessing the inclusion of race in diagnosing kidney diseases. Today, she will be giving a presentation titled The Policy Roadmap Towards Kidney mm -hmm. Health Equity. Without further ado, I will hand over the floor to Dr. Crystal Gadegbeku. Hello, and thank you all. Uh, thank you, Dr. Patel, Dr. Roth, Dr. Weiss, and my good colleague and friend, Dr. Fornoni, and the organizers of this uh, Grand Rounds. It is both a pleasure and an honor to be speaking um, in this uh, forum as a lecturer to Jacques Bourgogne, who I happen to know uh, as a young investigator or, or knew about while I was doing research in the African American study of kidney disease and hypertension. Today, I'm gonna to take you along a road of kidney health equity and couldn't be a better day to be doing this. And I'll soon explain why. I have a few disclosures, none related to this talk. Um, and essentially, we will, I will summarize briefly the known um, health disparities in kidney disease. I'm going to review the new kidney health policies with an eye towards um, how they may impact health disparities in kidney disease and discuss in my mind and based on the literature and my experiences, future federal policies that are actually needed um, to achieve health equity. 
So as I said, it couldn't be a more perfect day to be having this discussion at this time. Monday, we celebrated Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Yesterday, we reflected on 400,000 lives lost for COVID due to one virus, this one virus. And today, actually, as I'm speaking now, we are inaugurating a new president and vice president. And so it's fitting to start with this quote, of all the forms of inequalities, injustice and in health is the most shocking and the most inhumane because it often results in physical death. Martin Luther King was not a physician, he was not a nephrologist, but certainly this uh, quote rings true in what we see today. So just overviewing where we are with kidney disease, um, people of color are clearly overburdened with kidney disease. And here's some of the facts and figures on that. Black Americans are three and a half more, uh, more likely to have unsafe renal disease. Latinx Americans, one and a half fold more likely. There's more diabetes, more hypertension, morbidity uh, in this population, more obesity, and of course, more poverty. <laughs> in the same time, compared to whites, Black and Latinx Americans are less likely to be insured. They're less li likely to have um, primary care measures of uh, diabetes A1C twice a year, and definitely less likely to receive end-stage renal disease care than all racial groups. And just to drill down on this, this is a recent study that's basically in the e-press, looking at trends of pre-dialysis nephrology care, and that is care delivered by a nephrologist 12 months before initiating dialysis, as this is a very important time in which much preparation is needed um, to have a smooth transition for the patient's well-being and also for outcomes. Now, first of all, I'd like to note that if we, as we look at this across racial groups, first among whites over a decade, we've only seen a modest increase in even the reference population for pre-dialysis care. Um, and although things should be getting better over time, when we look as uh, with, among uh, people of color, that they have not even kept pace with that very low rate and actually falling further and further behind um, as, as time went on, um, in which Asian Americans only have come close to the, white, the reference in whites, which is abysmally low anyway. So to go on with under, under treatment, um, blacks, uh, transplantation is a major area where we see under treatment um, along the entire uh, process from referral to wait list to live donation to quality of kidney transplant and, um, and, and graft survival. And then very notably, when we think of those out to actually provide care, the nephrology workforce is neither diverse nor representative of its patient population. And I'll speak more to that living donation. I have this recent um, uh, publication in which I decided to add both without and with uh, adjustment for SES and healthcare access, because I think it's very interesting. And here's another example where we are just not going in the right direction. Using white American population as the reference population over time, at the, looking at the waitlist co cohorts, we've had a reduction in, in actual uh, transplant listing for live donation among Blacks, Asians, and Hispanics. And even when fully adjusted for those SES markers, um, although Hispanics seem to be doing better, there are still a fair, among Asian and Black Americans, a, a fair amount of disparity there in terms of living donations, suggesting that it is not just um, socioeconomic status that is a barrier at this at this point. So um, people of color tend to be more likely to be marginalized. And we, as we know, social determinants of health play a key role in kidney health. Um, but what we also realize is uh, once patients develop kidney failure and the further comorbidity and disability, then they are even more likely to have worsening social determinants of health, creating a vicious cycle 
leading to um, potentially death. So this pandemic we're in right now, um, marking the 400,000 lives lost yesterday, uh, really highlights these disparities in our country and, and hopefully brings us to urgency on having to fix them. Our now um, newly inducted pre Vice President Kamala Harris said, the re reality is that this public health crisis has shown a microscope on the gross disparities that existed based on race, based on income, long before we ever heard the word coronavirus. And the, so the focus that I'm putting on it is demanding that we demanding that we fix broken systems, which I think is very important. And just to highlight this, here's the uh, latest data on the race gaps of COVID-19 deaths across the age group and across race, races. And I, as you can see, it's very dramatic among younger groups and, and diminishes, although for our Black Americans, never even equalizes white Americans at age 85 or older. Um, in the beginning, the CDC didn't even, uh, was not even recognizing pub or, or publicly uh, making people aware of the kidney issue. But clearly COVID has a major impact in patients with kidney disease and also causing kidney disease as it um, has uh, causes acute kidney failure and maybe leading to a, a surge of, of kidney disease in this country in addition to the epidemic we're already having. And clearly we know now that dialysis patients have the highest risk of death when uh, they're infected with COVID. This recent study performed at the VA, um, at a series of VA hospitals um, shows uh, some of that uh, renal of complications of COVID. This is very recent, February to July. Thir a third of population have an acute kidney injury, although we're seeing over time that that is diminishing, possibly because we are um, better at providing care, we know more what to do with this infection uh, uh, when, when patients present. But still, 12% require dialysis, which is a, a significant number, and the real um, worrisome number is that almost half of them do not recover to baseline renal function at the time of discharge. Um, if, this, if those patients continue to have uh, kidney disease in the form of chronic kidney disease, we are really looking at a worsening um, global epidemic of chronic kidney disease as this is a worldwide issue. Um, the other interesting thing is acute kidney injury uh, is associated with, as with many, many other diseases, an increased risk of death. The risk is quite high at sixfold and seems to be much stronger in the African American community. And very interestingly, as we've seen with other kidney diseases, the percentage of AKI seems to track with the number of black, Blacks in the population regionally. Obviously, more needs to be looked at with regards to this. This is why ASN was, um, was part of a group of, uh, of organizations that, that gave testimony to House Ways and Means Committee on um, the effects of COVID, particularly the disproportionate impact on communities of color. And one of the two, two main points in, in their testimony was that racism is a public health crisis with profound kidney health manifestations and that we're seeing an intersection between COVID-19 infection and kidney disease in terms of health disparities, creating greater, greater risks of death. So what we need now is policies. We need policies to address um, these disparities. And, and as, as once, as already said, COVID-19 just highlighted that there's a lot of fixing that needs to be done. Programs are progress, but policy is power. So one of the newest, um, uh, one of the new health policies, and actually the first of its kind in, in the kidney space is advancing American kidney health, which is a federal policy I'm gonna go through. And we are very excited about this because for the first time, we're able to see real policy change that benefits patients with kidney disease. So this may seem quite atypical at this current stage with all of the polarization going on. But this US federal policy, which I was happy to introduce at, on, on the Hill, is bipartisan and bicameral, 
Cameral um, both committing to optimizing kidney health, mainly through the recognition of the extreme uh, burden of kidney disease, both on patients and the economic burden it has on the Medicare system. The thing is for policies uh, addressing kidney health to be extremely effective, based on the overburden that I showed you, there needs to be significant advancement in, in addressing race and ethnic disparities. And the other thing we have to be clear on and constantly reevaluate is that we have to make sure these policies are promoting health equity and not leading to unintended consequences of worsening these health disparities. So the AAKH, as it's known, um, has uh, three major, very ambitious goals. Um, the first goal is to reduce the risk of kidney failure, but to reduce it by 25% by 2030. I think that that will be very, very difficult to do, particularly in light of what the COVID pandemic is, is doing at this time, but it's sure worth reaching for. The next is to improve access to and quality of person-centered treatments. And specifically, the metric for this is to achieve 80% of incident patients with kidney failure to receive home dialysis or transplantation because of that, their uh, transplant being the optimal care for uh, patients with end-stage renal disease or a new form of therapy as we're working towards um, the wearable kidney at, as we speak. Um, this too is very highly ambitious and there's only one uh, country in the world that is able to achieve a home dialysis rate that, that comes near these numbers. And then of course to increase the optimal care, the optimal management for end-stage renal disease, which is transplantation. And the metric was to double the numbers of available kidneys for transplantation as Kidneys available, kidney availability is the main bottleneck. So how uh, does the AAKH policy plan to do this? Well, it has this template of raising awareness about kidney disease, slowing progression, improving current treatment options, increasing access to transplantation, and very important, promoting research, discovery, and innovation. And from now, I will delve into each of these and um, speak on what is going on and what I think probably needs to be considered. So uh, AAKH initiative uh, to raise awareness has been designed to relaunch the HHS Health and Human Services National Kidney Foundation Consumer Campaign. Now National Kidney Foundation is the largest organization uh, for patient ad advocacy in the kidney space. So that makes a whole lot of sense. As well, they plan to initiate the HHS ASN campaign for the community, kidney community, which is aimed at um, making sure uh, healthcare professionals who are involved in kidney care are also well equipped um, to, to provide the education that is needed and are educated about all the new policies that are going on. Of course, this cannot be done uh, effectively without motivating our primary care physicians who are taking care of these patients and screen patients for kidney disease and, and also excite the capital markets, bringing visibility to um, kidney disease. Uh, the NKF has put out this hashtag minute for your kidneys, which is a survey that they've developed. And let me see if I can do this. We will try. Well, it's taking a long time, so we're going to skip that. But are you the 33 is a, uh, okay, let's see. It's an infomercial developed in multiple languages um, that uh, recommends people take this, this survey and then get followed up. Very slow. Well, I don't think it's worth worth going through. Let's go back to the talk. Um, but it's a nice way to try to bring the community in 
and, and has, as I said, multiple languages, uses famous people to kind of raise uh, engagement. Of course, raising awareness is a two-pronged thing. It involves providers and the communities. And we need to have a structure that allows for um, increased testing, basically through, through patients and through providers um, having a recognition of kidney, kidney risks. Um, this is over a decade old, but I can tell you things are not much different. The National Kidney Foundation has had this kidney early evaluation program where they look at a targeted population, uh, test them for kidney disease, and then uh, look to see how many are aware that, that, that they have kidney disease. And for all um, ethnic and racial populations, um, it's just the awareness is very, very low. Um, and if we even look by stages, and this is two different time frames. This is the earlier study and very recent study. Um, and Haynes looked at the same thing, patients having kidney disease, how many were aware. This is based on stage. And it's only till you get to very late stage kidney disease in the general population that people were aware, 40%. This was in 2008. But this, uh, this similar type of study was duplicated in specifically a targeted population of African Americans in a high risk pop, um, in a high risk clinic for a high risk kidney clinic, cl uh, actually primary care clinic with high risk for kidney disease, and showed kind of the same pattern. The only difference is, and this is much much smaller numbers, that by this time in stage four, um, all of the patients were were aware of kidney disease. We should see whether the NHANES um, numbers have changed over time, and I, but I kind of doubt that they have. So if we're looking at addressing healthcare disparities, we have to look at how we can specifically raise, raise awareness in communities of color. The KEEP program is, is a very good one that um, should be continued. It targeted, it's a targeted screening um, it really specifically has had outreach in minority communities. One nice thing about this is we have to get around the barrier of access to care because the same patients are, are going to be missed. And so free and voluntary really in the community. And obviously increased awareness of, of risk factors or factors that are associated with kidney disease and, and encourage follow-up. One thing I, I think um, would be what worth doing is social media is such a big part of our lives, ads and marketing as well. If you think about what is done with NFL players and pink shoes and breast cancer and the breast cancer ribbon, everyone knows these symbols for, for awareness of breast cancer, effective campaigns that can reach communities of color um, with regard to kidney disease may be very, very helpful. And then the initiatives to slow progression of kidney disease. We have new therapies among us at SGLT2 inhibitors are, are, are definitely looking at uh, preventing kidney disease, diabetic and potentially non-diabetic kidney disease based on the latest clinical trials. We need to embrace these therapies, um, get them into the, 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 the office and from the office into the patients. Artificial intelligence is really on the horizon and research and application protect in, in terms of predicting patients who can progress quicker that we need to pay more attention to. And of course, better biomarkers for GFR as we're working on that now and as well progression are, are, are gonna be very important. These will be important for all populations and obviously have a tremendous impact on those who are, have health disparities. However, in communities of color, we have to deal with the fact that these drugs, especially these new drugs, new devices, may not be accessible to these populations. And so we need to think about how we can minimize this barrier. Further, to support research that deals with the social determinants of health and progression of disease is important. And any population that has a genetic susceptibility towards kidney disease, like APOL1, um, research to support that is going to be tremendously helpful. And then lastly, decision tools, which don't come with bias um, if, if done right, uh, would be very helpful in focusing on the people who, who need the extra 
extra um, care or who need extra watching and monitoring. Another part of the AAKH that is being put into place as we speak is the value-based kidney care. This is a very new and the mandatory program just began January 1. The mandatory end-stage renal disease treatment choice model is, is the first model to be put in place. It only um, uh, includes end-stage renal disease patients um, on some form of dialysis. It is a mandatory CMS experiment in which they've used these what they call hospital referral regions, which I never knew anything about until this kidney model came about which are basically areas of the country. They're randomly selecting, um, basically creating a case control environment in which in the cases, in the model, a uh, new model group, they're going to incentivize reimbursement for transplantation and home dialysis. And the goal of the program is to see if we can enhance those uh, therapies and improve quality uh, while reducing Medicare expenditure. Complementary to this model is a voluntary set of models called the kidney care models that are soon to start April 1. These models go a little bit further upstream and really focus on um, the transitions of care from CKD stage four, five to end stage renal disease. Because we know by the time patients reach end stage renal disease, some of the risk factors for death are already well in play. So the idea is earlier intervention may be much more helpful, particularly when it, we, we consider dialysis optimization or what we're talking about there is preparing the patient, having them educated and prepared, choose a dialysis modality and, and arrive at dialysis in the optimal condition. This is not only good for a patient, relieving patient suffering, but also is, is um, a tremendous economic benefit cuts down on the co cost of care because patients are crashing into dialysis in the hospital. So dialysis optimization and also home dialysis and transplantation are incentivized in those models. And those two models will be working side by side for those who apply to the kidney care model. They can have actually both in play at the same time, depending on what hospital region they're in. Other insurance agencies are following suit. Those are CMMI invention, and so they're Medicare, but Blue Cross and Blue Cross Blue Shield is Independence Blue Cross is partnering with Strive Health to really come up with a similar plan that will be available for um, commercial and Medicare Advantage patients. And so pay for value, value-based care. It too is very similar. If you see, it's very similar to the kidney care uh, uh, models. It's including stage four, stage five, and stage real disease, dialysis optimization, home dialysis transplantation is incentivized, although they have added here a disincentivization for emergency and inpatient hospitalization. This also includes an education program, and astutely, they've noticed that patient navigator support is very helpful. So we're certainly moving towards um, value-based care in the, in the kidney world, and evaluating this effectiveness of, on, on kidney health. So these models certainly address areas that, are, uh, that have significant racial and ethnic disparities, transplantation, home therapy, quality, multidisciplinary care, providing support systems in place, reducing silos. So they're clearly affecting that. The one thing we have to be very careful is that these models don't lead to cherry picking and lemon dropping of patients because of the monetary incentivization built in. So if you were not to include patients who you think were high risk for a disincentivization or less likely to incentivize you, you could actually end up with worse, further marginalization of these patients and worsening health disparities. And so there's talk and obviously interest in adjusting for specific populations and regions, but we also have to keep in, uh, into consideration, we do need to know those absolute differences so that we can have more effective systems to, to make these kidney care models work in all patients. 
So, and there's multiple barriers that these kidney models really don't fix and don't address. And a perfect example is, oh yes, you'd like patients to have more choice towards home therapies. Well, that would be great. But what if they don't have a home? What if they have home instability? That's not giving the patient any choice. They don't have the choice to choose home therapy because it's not gonna be safe for them. So we have to consider that and I'll talk more about those social determinant issues later. So when, when we're pushing for, for health equity in these kidney models, there's just no way to achieve health equity in my mind without dealing with the social determinants of health. We have to improve access to care. We have to broaden, broaden insurance co coverage. We have to provide greater social support to equalize the chance that these patients have to make the choices that are best for them. Staph assisted dialysis. Transportation is a major issue and a barrier that leads to significant morbidity and mortality among patients. Maybe a, a kidney health transportation system that's built like an Uber or Lyft would be something that could be considered to, to actually help um, support patients who have these needs. Then of course, the expansion of telehealth has been definitely a part of our everyday lives. Thankfully, the 21st Century Cures Act was already signed and ready to go and we were developing systems towards telehealth when COVID hit and that just accelerated the plans and got us um, into using it uh, quite quickly with the pandemic to, to avoid risks of infection and yet be able to take care of patients. But parity of telehealth and in-person visits definitely has been helpful but the the issue is what about how telemedicine is, is what about the access of telemedicine and in, in various populations and various and how is there and, and the possibility of disparity there well this is very interesting because i think it reflects what i've seen at temple we had a problem with no-show rates um averaging 20 30 percent sometimes in, even in our nephrology fellows clinic as much as 50% for in-person in visits. And one thing we noticed that when we switched to telehealth, at least telehealth from a phone call perspective, that we had such success with reaching our patients, we now knew what they were actually putting in their mouths for medications. It was amazing the difference that, that we saw in terms of that. And here in this study that is recently um, in e published, um, this is uh, the same thing findings have been seen in terms of telehealth completion visits, phone visits. Black and Hispanics were, were much more likely to have those completed visits. Whereas interestingly, Asian Americans were not, which may have uh, also been related to, and the, clearly for others, language barriers were uh, potentially an issue. And, and though um, income may have been, le decreased income did not affect the phone visits. However, if you look at video visits, uh, the opposite is true, where Black Americans were more likely to uh, complete telephone visits, video visits were much less likely to be completed in African Americans and also Hispanics and those of lower income, which were equal when, when, com when uh, compared to phone visits. So, um, the technology issues and other things may, may play a clear role. We already know that income and the availability of broadband um, is, is inversely related um, as shown here. But it's beyond that. It's not only having uh, broadband in your house, but it may be your knowledge and skill set, and maybe uh, attitudes about the use of that. Um, I can tell you their patients did have not wanted to you to see them in their home. Uh, various other things may be involved in this. And this digital divide is important and something we need to conquer as I think telemedicine is here to stay. And then increasing, uh, uh, the next area has been increasing access to kidney transplants. And, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, we are well aware that if we look at the UNOS database at any given time, that the majority of people who are waiting for kidney, waiting for transplants are, are kidneys. So 99,000 of the 119 people waiting, waiting for solid organs are waiting for kidneys. Yet at the same time, we all realize kidneys are continually being discarded. 
So I think we have a problem here. And I put this slide in, this image in of Disney's future world. Of course, you being in, Mi uh, in Miami, in Florida, but more because uh, Future World, you know, was built on the World's Fair many, many years ago. It was an amazing thing of its time, but now it's old and, and you know, it's talking about a future that's actually a past now. And Disney is looking at completely overhauling the park so that it really is a future world. Well, we could say the same thing for transplantation. Kitty transplantation was an amazing accomplishment, but uh, the system is old and antiquated and we've had a lot of uh, advancements since then. The whole organ procurement system uh, needs to be made better, more accountable, more standard uh, metrics. We need to increase the organ supply and really reform the way the metrics are, are, are done to promote increased transplantation, which has not really been thought of in, in a major way. Um, so for communities of color, obviously enhancing transplantation would be very helpful. Um, and using, there is currently a kidney donor profile index being used that includes EGFR, and therefore we have to consider these race-based clinical decision-making algorithms if they are helpful or harmful. And there will most likely be uh, a task force that will address this in transplantation very soon as it is being addressed for EGFR uh, for general population and CKD patients. Removal of dual insurance as a requirement is a major limitation. Um, and uh, I mean, dual insurance is a major limitation. So removal of that would be po possibly very helpful. And very important is the possibility and the potential for one office that handles organ and transplant policy would be very helpful. Right now it's redundant. It's done in many agencies within the federal government. The regulation is all over the place. And so we really need to consider that. And, and the whole patient evaluation system, the evaluation criteria uh, needs validation in, in terms of aligning with outcomes. Um, there are things that are in there that may be barriers that are really not that helpful. So, and lastly, AKH initiative, has uh, shown a light in promoting research and discovery and innovation. Um, recently, the CDC published that 37 million Americans have kidney disease. A, a Government Accountability Office report released in 2017 actually reviewed the amount of research going on in kidney disease and determined that less than 1% of the amount spent on the end-stage renal disease program that is fully supported by Medicare is devoted to research. As a matter of fact, the cost of kidney care is more than the entire NIH budget. Um, and so there's clearly an imbalance here. One other um, initiative that has taken place at AAKH uh, fully supports is Kidney X, which is a public and private partnership to catalyze new technologies. This too has been bipartisan. I've been in offices where both Republicans and Democrats have applauded this um, mechanism, which is um, to really put monies together and bring streamline agencies across um, FDA, uh, NIH, uh, to, to be able to produce devices and attract venture capital to actually get things into out new inventions out into being used. And the Artificial Kidney Prize was the first of this. And the prizes were already um, awarded and we're looking now uh, in a competitive way to see who makes it to develop the, the, the wearable kidney, which we'll be very excited to have. And I see that it possibly will be able to be tested within several years. AAKH also highlights that existing research is very important. So in terms of promoting research in color, obviously increasing to be helpful to meet an urgent need. And I just put it out here, $120 billion are spent annually to manage kidney disease, of which 50 billion is in the end stage Medicare, end stage renal disease Medicare program while 671 million is NIH, and I agree that's NIH alone um, if we took into account 
other agencies that provide research, it would be slightly more, but not a lot more, leading to less than 1% of Medicare spending. So increasing federal funding, not only to NIH, but to PCORI, our VA, DOD, would be uh, extremely helpful, and particularly investing in research that affects, that, that focuses on social determinants of health, inclusion of, of, of uh, inclusive patient engagement, patient activation, artificial intelligence, precision medicine, decision tools, those things would be extremely helpful. So that's AAKH, but I think we need to go beyond it, the advancing American kidney health if we're really going to achieve equity. Um, this quote uh, kind of says it all. Every system is perfectly designed to achieve the results it gets. Well, we need a system that's designed to achieve health equity. Um, Senator Dale O'Connor once said, in order to cultivate a set of leaders with legitimacy in the eyes of the citizenry, it is necessary that the path to leadership be visible, visibly open to talented and qualified individuals of every race and ethnicity, and all members of our heterogeneous society must have confidence in the openness and integrity of the educational institutions that provide this training, thereby giving you this um, mutual bi-directional interaction. We have to promote diversity at all levels of leadership and at all areas of, of the healthcare workforce. It's sad to provide this statistic, but it's true and we need to own it. 1975, 76, sorry, there were 6.3 uh, first year US medical students were, who were black. Here we are four days, four decades later, and we have that same percentage. We can do better. And then when we think of myself, I'm basically a rare breed in the one to 2% uh, population of uh, whole professors. Um, promoting the workforce in healthcare uh, workforce pipeline really involves starting very early. And this quote kind of uh, emphasizes that. I was amazed to learn that if a student doesn't take algebra by the eighth grade, he or she will not likely choose a health career. By then, the student has chosen a different pathway and is very unlikely to go back and take algebra and calculus later, thus assuring a career other than medicine, pharmacy, or dentistry. That is why it is so important to reach students and their parents early enough to keep their options open. So when we look at the workforce now and the population, um, we have 13 and 18% Black and Hispanic Americans who are overburdened with, with COVID-19 cases who are overburdened with CKD and a physician workforce that is much, much lower, medical students and even nephrology fellows that are not representative at all uh, of even the population. So as we redefine the workforce, and this was put out by Ellen Letter, past president of the ASN, diversity, gender equity are key parts of of uh, where we should be focusing um, to provide the best care for patients. And then along with it, we must recognize that 40, actually 40% 40 of uh, the nephrologists in communities, uh, it has been estimated are foreign trained. Therefore, foreign trained health professionals are taking care of millions of Americans, often in areas where there's limited access to care. They also are, are helping collaborate in pioneering research. And so dismantling immigration barriers for health professionals is, is also very important in, in achieving this is health equity that we would like to achieve. So as much as we like to think about our area where we have the most uh, input experience, clinical care, maybe health behaviors, we must recognize that the drivers of health, at least 50% of drivers of health, are beyond health care policies. 
And so we really have to, federal policies have to reach beyond that to really have an effect on, uh, in, in achieving health equity. And I just want to remind you that the health poverty rate is a key driver of social determinants of health, which is a key driver of health disparities in kidney disease. And this is where we are. I mean, we have to acknowledge that we have significant, significant difference in poverty rates among races that is importantly driving health outcomes. Um, and health outcomes include kidney disease in multiple, multiple ways. Poverty has an impact uh, on this. Uh, Nelson Mandela said, health cannot be a question of income. It is a fundamental human right. And I truly believe that. So if we are really to achieve kidney health equity, or really you can almost put any organ here, we have to have federal policies that address systemic racism, immigration, jobs and housing, as well as research and healthcare and community health programs. We also have to see how we can strategize to have a more inclusive healthcare workforce, build structures that allow for transportation um, of all patients to uh, all people, and also build in the technologies that are needed to take care of patients, as well as um, invest in research that will help not only with the diseases, but with social determination social determinants of health, which are linked to these diseases. So it's much broader than healthcare policy. And kidney health equity is the goal. We want everybody to be able to reach the apple. So I'm gonna end here. And this is um, from um, aptly appropriate as it's from the American Association of Kidney Patients, an organization that I've worked with and I've enjoyed working with um, that is clearly realizing that there are significant opportunities to improve the health of patients with kidney disease. And they, they um, have labeled this the decade of the kidney. Um, and we have to remember that, you know, kidney is about people. It's sort of about people with kidneys. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity there, um, but, I think there's a lot more that can be done if we really want to achieve health equity. And so um, it's so appropriate to, on this day, Inauguration Day, where we have a new administration coming in um, that has to face the COVID pandemic and, and um, other issues related to health care that, um, that I am here today to speak on um, the opportunities that we have and that we can further have the potential to drive forward um, a healthcare system that is actually for all people. So that is the end of my talk. I want to acknowledge patients and their families I've taken care of and those I've worked with on the Hill, um, making this visible. Uh, Temple University, of course, American Society of Nephrology, which is giving me a lot of opportunities to do health policy, uh, to to be in the health policy sphere and all the committees that have thought about this and the National In Institutes of Diabetic and, and Kidney Disease, which um, digestive and kidney disease, which has been actually working on reforming their policies for greater research. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gaddick. It was a very timely and important grand rounds. And although I understand we're very nephrocentric uh, in many ways, especially with Dr. Fornoni here, uh, and we appreciate that so very much. Uh, the lessons that you have discussed are actually applicable to liver transplant as well and, and, and other areas. So thank you very much for this very timely and important topic that we all need to translate into our own fields as we look at health disparities. One of the things that's so important in closing the gap uh, of health disparities is engagement of the community that itself needs to be uh, queried and go along with you in all these, these efforts. How have you organized that at Temple 
Uh, what have you found to be the most expeditious way to engage the communities most affected by uh, the uh, disparities? Yeah, that's a great question. And I certainly don't have all the answers. I think this is something that we need to really actually study. And we haven't done enough research on it. But one of the things I've done is try to utilize important events that happen nationally, really bring it to the patients and bring it to them in the community. So for instance, World Health Organization, uh, World Health Organization puts up um, World Kidney Day is one of the ISN um, initiatives. We spend a day, a month thinking about kidney disease. I make sure we have really nice education programs in which um, we excite the community, offer prizes, help them bring their families, um, and really get, get into talking with patients about the issues of kidney disease. Also been on the radio a few times and really had the um, opportunity to talk and actually doing with, with colleagues in, in endocrine and cardiovascular medicine to, to kind of talk about the whole patient because it's not just the kidneys, it's usually these diseases affecting um, many uh, patients. The other thing I've known is to listen and to, to really listen, um, to actually hear and not necessarily be able to solve the problems, but actually patients feel um, uh, when you listen to them, they they feel that you really have their best interests at heart and it creates a better doctor-patient relationship for this. And so I've tried to put together programs where we have a lot of listening. Um, and then we've developed some, uh, within our nurse practitioner programs, um, our program, uh, an education sessions that really allow them to spend much more time with the patients than we can as physicians, allowing them to bring their families again and, and do a lot more educating and talking and, and bi-directional discussion. So I think that's on the way, but I really think this is something that needs to be studied. Thank you. This, the floor is open for questions. Alessia, do, are you, you're on mute. Thank you, Crystal, for the excellent and timely presentation. I second that uh, from Dr. Weiss' comment. Uh, you know, I, I don't, when you show us slides on the prevalence versus awareness from the Vassalotti study, uh, I noticed that the prevalence was actually in that study was less uh, for kidney disease was less in African American and white. Do you think that actually the access of health, the the fact that there is less access to healthcare make us fail to capture the true prevalence in the underserved population? Sure, I think that's highly likely, and that's why I think something like the Keep study, where they actually going out in the community and getting serum creatinines, where <laughs> you, you're not, they're not coming to the office, is really telling the true story. So I think we need to do more of that if we want to really own this. Thank you. And for the, for the medical students and the residents here, there's a lot of activity in the community by the National Kidney Foundation. They're always looking for volunteers to go out in the community to screen patients for kidney diseases. So if you're interested in participating, please feel free to reach out to me as well. Actually, we have a program in first and second year medical school where we have, a, it's called Journey Through Kidney Disease. And part of that program, we talk about health disparities. We talk about all the research. We talk, we have them look at urines and do other fun medical stuff. But one of the things we have them do is join one of the either walks or screenings um, in the community with NKF or our partners so that they can actually learn how they can advocate. Well, we wish we could send you some of our warmth up to Philly. Uh, in the meantime, we, we are thinking of you, and we hope that in the future we'll be able to welcome you in person here. Thank you, everybody, for participating in Grand Rounds. Pay attention to the chat for the link in order to re obtain MOC and CME credit. Thank you, everybody, and stay healthy. Thank you.